it is strongly linked to the development of duodenal and gastric ulcers as well as gastric cancer. So as you know, um, up to 80% of patients who are infected with this bacteria are actually asymptomatic. So they are not aware of the, the presence of this bacteria. And as you can see from the diagram, the bacteria is actually a spiral shape and it has about three to five uh, polar flagella. So this helps with this motility of this bacteria. Now a little bit of the history of this discovery of this Helicobacter pylori. Now the, uh, the gentleman on the right is actually uh, the pathologist from Australia. He's, uh, he's Robin Warren. Now in 1979, he noticed this bacteria in one of the slides, uh, look at uh, affecting the lining of the stomach. And at that time, uh, most people believe that um, the stomach is a sterile area with no bacteria and, has, and didn't pay very much attention to this. So in 1981, he worked with a uh, gastroenterologist, Barry Marshall. So he was at that time only a registrar and together they began to study this bacteria. And because he, this uh, Barry Marshall was frustrated with the lack of animal models, to understand uh, this particular bacteria. He decided to infect himself with this uh, bacteria and he developed gastritis and he isolated the bacteria and he also proved that this bacteria is associated with gastritis and even peptic ulcer. So for their role in understanding this bacteria and its pathogenesis, they were awarded a Nobel Prize for medicine in 2005. Now, um, more than 50% of the world population actually harbor H. pylori. So it's actually the most uh, widespread infection in the world. And as you can see from the map, um, the infection varies between regions and even between uh, different nations. And it is found that the infection is more prevalent in developing countries. And the most common route of infection is either through the oral oral route or the fecal oral route. And most of the infections occurs yeah, during early childhood. So some of the risk factors associated with acquiring this infection is mainly in the developing countries, with poor social economic conditions, family overcrowding, poor sanitary conditions, and also possibly an ethnic or genetic predisposition. Now, a little bit of the pathogenesis. So the, some of the characteristic of this bacteria is that it, is, it produces large amounts of urease. Now, urease will break down the urea into ammonia and carbon dioxide. So the ammonia allows the bacteria to survive in the acidic, very acidic environment of the stomach. And the flagella allows it to move towards the deeper part of the mucus. And there are adhesions uh, on the bacteria that will bind with the receptors of the gastric epithelium. And it releases some toxins which damages the gastric epithelium. So the ammonia itself is also toxic to the epithelial cells. And also on top of that, there were proteases, there were cytotoxins, phospholipases, which also damages the gastric epithelium. And some uh, strains of H. pylori also has this CAC A protein, which is a cytotoxic associated gene A protein, which will stimulate the production of chemotactic factors for the neutrophils and inflammatory cells of the host. So the end result is that the colonization by the bacteria will cause this chronic gastritis. So as I mentioned, 80% uh, of the patients will be asymptomatic, but some may develop symptoms. And, but these symptoms are quite nonspecific. It may be nausea, vomiting, uh, some abdominal pain, uh, heartburn, diarrhea, 
hunger in the mornings and the halitosis. And uh, Barry Marshall, actually, when he self-infected it, he also developed uh, halitosis, which is noticed by his colleagues. So how do we diagnose the helicobacter pylori? So one of the tests we can use, which is non-invasive, is a urea breath test. Now, the urea breath test actually diagnoses the active infection. And so patients are given the urea, which is labeled with either 14 carbon or 13 carbon. And they are taken orally. Now, the bacteria produces the urea, which breaks down the urea, as I mentioned, into carbon dioxide and ammonia. Now, the sort of labeled carbon dioxide will then be exhaled, trapped, processed, analyzed, and we can actually then discover whether it is a positive or negative test for helicobacter. This test is quite simple to perform and it's quick and it's less expensive than endoscopy. Uh, but the thing is you need to avoid antibiotics, PPI or bismuth, about two weeks prior to the test. Otherwise, you may get a false negative uh, test result. Another test uh, that sometimes we use is a serological test. However, serological tests, uh, it detects the antibodies. So it might mean a current infection or it might mean a patient who has a past infection. So because the antibodies decline very slowly, so even if you eradicate the H. pylori, the serology may still be positive. So it's not very useful for testing active infection. The other test we can use is a stool antigen test. Now this tests the actual presence of H. pylori antigen in the stool. And its accuracy in terms of sensitivity and specificity is quite similar to a urea breath test. And it's extremely useful in children. And it's also very useful to monitor the response to eradication, whether you have successfully eradicated the bacteria or not. So one of the tests we commonly use also is the endoscopy. Now, endoscopy is invasive though, but it's simple, which is quick. We can biopsy the uh, stomach lining for uh, histology under the h &E stain. We can also do a rapid urea test or cloth test. Now this will show us uh, quite quickly whether it's positive or negative by the change of the color. So if it's negative, it's yellow, and if it's positive, it's pink. Sometimes we also take biopsy to send for, uh, to the lab for culture and sensitivity so that we can actually culture the bacteria and test whether there are certain antibiotics are, are able to treat this bacteria. Um, and the other advantage of endoscopy, of course, is to look at the, it's a diagnostic test as well, and you can biopsy any lesions or you can look for any inflammation, erosions or ulcers. So what are the diseases that are associated with H. pylori? Now, so majority of them are asymptomatic. Some may develop a non-ulcer dyspepsia. Uh, and about one to 4% of them may develop gastric cancer, or 5 to 10% may be associated with peptic ulcer, either in the stomach or in the duodenum. A very small percentage, uh, less than 1%, may have developed this gastric maltoma or lymphoma, which is a mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma. And then outside of the GI tract, uh, there are some studies to suggest some association with iron deficiency anemia, as well as idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura, ITP. Now, for peptic ulcer, there is very strong association with H. pylori, especially for duodenal ulcer. For those, who, for those ulcers, they are not caused by NSAIDs. Up to 95 to 99% of duodenal ulcers are due to H. pylori. For stomach ulcers, uh, about 70% are associated with H. pylori, and the other 30% or so generally due to aspirin or NSAIDs. So in peptic ulcer, what are the potential benefits of treating the H. pylori? Now, if you eradicate the H. pylori, uh, 
you can actually reduce the risk of recurrence of these ulcers and also the re-bleeding rates in patients who develop uh, peptic ulcer bleeding. And once you eradicate the bacteria, it is actually not necessary to continue with the anti secretory maintenance therapy with PPI uh, when it successfully eradicated the bacteria. But it's important in this clinical scenario to make sure that you have successfully eradicated by doing a urea breath test uh, about six weeks uh, after you start treatment. Okay, so some patients uh, may develop non ulcer dyspepsia due to H. pylori. However, if you treat the H. pylori, there is some benefit, but it is not a very big benefit. So some patients, even after you treat the uh, H. pylori, they may still have some dyspepsia because dyspepsia is a, a very multifactorial symptom. So it may not uh, completely go away. So it's important when you counsel the patients uh, to manage the expectations. And uh, you have to consider these uh, things as well when you decide to treat the H. pylori and after individual assessment and after discussing with the patient. The more important thing is when you encounter a patient with dyspepsia, uh, even if you find that the H. pylori is positive, you need to be aware of the presence of alarm symptoms or the age of the patient. So if anyone more than 40 years old with a recent onset of dyspepsia and needs further evaluation, especially if there's has these alarm symptoms such as serious loss of appetite or weight, dysphagia or dinophagia, vomiting, fatigue, anemia, melina, abdominal mass or lymph adenopathy, jaundice, family history of gastric cancer, or patients who have previous gastric surgery, a new onset of symptoms of dyspepsia, especially the surgery is more than 10 years ago. So these patients will require further evaluation and most likely an endoscopy. Next, we move on to the gastric cancer. Now, gastric cancer is the fifth most common cancer and the third leading cause of cancer deaths worldwide. Although the incidence of gastric cancer is falling, it is still uh, uh, important because about one in 12 of all oncological deaths are attributable to gastric cancer. The other interesting thing about gastric cancer is also that its frequency varies greatly across different geographical locations. So in East Asia, especially in countries like Japan, Korea, the incidence of gastric cancer is very high, whereas in the Western nations, uh, it's much lower. In Singapore, the incidence has also been dropping. So based on the 2015 uh, cancer registry, um, stomach cancer uh, ranks probably about seventh in male patients and about ninth in female patients. As you can see, it covers about 4.7% in men and about 3.4% of uh, new cancers diagnosed. So in 1994, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, as part of the World Health Organization, declared the H. pylori is a group one carcinogen. So it places H. pylori in the same category as smoking for lung cancer and hepatitis B for uh, liver cancer. So H. pylori is actually responsible for about, 70, about 65% of gastric cancers worldwide. And various studies have shown that patients with uh, H. pylori positive had about three to six times the normal cancer risk for gastric, I mean, normal risk for gastric cancer. So gastric cancer can be broadly divided into two histological distinct types. So the diffuse type, which consists of cancer cells that do not form the glandular structures. And then you have the more common intestinal type which progresses to a series of well-defined histological steps, which I'll elaborate later. So from this slide, there are a few things you can note. First of all, the, the, the intestinal type of gastric cancer, as I mentioned, it goes through this um, cascade. 
So the H. pylori causes this superficial gastritis and then it leads to chronic inflammation. And over time, it takes usually a couple of years to decades, it will develop, some may develop into atrophic gastritis and subsequently intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia, and finally uh, carcinoma. So the important thing is that the H. pylori also has different strains. So there are virulence factors in the H. pylori that uh, increases the risk for gastric cancer in these patients. And sometimes it works also uh, in combination with other environmental factors such as high salt consumption, smoking. And certain factors like antioxidants may actually reduce the risk of gastric cancer. And for the host factors, also there is this phenomenon of host gene polymorphism. And that will also affect the chances of the patient to get gastric cancer. And as you go along the cascade, uh, because the H. pylori infection actually recruit some of these inflammatory cells, and the immune response itself actually increases the risk of gastric uh, cancer. And when the patient develops atrophic gastritis, the, the hypoacidity also contribute towards the, the risk of progression into carcinoma. So just one of the uh, factors that we look at is actually the CAG or CAG-A protein. So it can actually be translocated into gastric epithelial cells and to a various uh, 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 signaling pathways, it can actually affect the cell proliferation as well as the, even the uh, junction between the cells. It affects the behavior of the cancer as well. So I mentioned earlier that the polymorphism by like certain patients who have overexpression or some of these genetic focus may also increase the risk of gastric cancer. And if the patient has overexpression of more number of genetic focus, then the risk also goes up by many folds. Because as you can see, many, many uh, patients who have uh, H. pylori infection do not eventually develop gastric cancer. So besides the, uh, the virulence factors of the bacteria, the host factors also play a very important part. So the complex interaction between the environment, the host, and the bacteria will eventually result in a, a, a gastric cancer. The important thing to note is that even if you eradicate the bacteria, when the, the uh, process has already gone into intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia, sometimes it actually can cross into the point of no return. So the, the, even if you eradicate the bacteria at this point, the patient may eventually still develop gastric cancer. So the magnitude of the effect of intervention against H. pylori actually becomes less and less as time goes on. So it's important to note that to be more effective, actually the intervention should be early when the patient is just getting superficial gastritis or early uh, gastritis. So how do we then treat uh, H. pylori? So the indications for H. pylori eradication uh, very clear-cut indications are those patients who have got peptic ulcer disease, whether they're active or not, uh, those with uh, mouth lymphoma, those with atrophic gastritis, and patients with precancerous lesions like intestinal metaplasia. And then the first degree relatives of uh, gastric cancer patients uh, or patients who have uh, gastric cancer resection, either early gastric cancer or advanced gastric cancer. And of course, patients who have, after discussion, although they are asymptomatic and they are found to have H. pylori positive, it is also uh, an indication if the patient understands the treatment. So how do we treat uh, H. pylori? So for first-line therapy, uh, we can 
divide them into whether the patient has got penicillin allergy or not. And previously, when we treat H. pylori, the triple therapy is a seven-day course. But uh, recent studies have shown that actually if you increase the duration to 10 days or even up to 14 days, the efficacy of the eradication is higher. Uh, so um, generally now we should treat for at least 10 days, if not 14 days. So you can start with uh, a triple therapy. So you can give clarithromycin, amoxicillin, and a PPI in the BD dosage. But bear in mind that uh, clarithromycin, uh, uh, there are increasing uh, resistance to this uh, uh, antibiotic in some of the H. pylori uh, that we find. So there are other options, including concomitant therapy, which is a PPI plus three antibiotics, including amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and metronidazole. You can also use a bismuth quadruple therapy. Okay. Or you can even have a combination with uh, clarithromycin and bismuth. Now, in those patients who are allergic to penicillin, you can use a bismuth quadruple therapy. So after giving the first line therapy, and if you find that when you do a urea breath test subsequently and it's turned out to be positive, then you have failed the first line that you consider empiric second line therapy. So in, in uh, second line therapy, it's important not to use the same antibiotic. So if you have used uh, clarithromycin as a first line, then you should consider using either bismuth or a levofloxacin containing triple therapy. If, if, if the concomitant therapy has failed, then you can use bismuth or levofloxacin as well. But if you have used the bismuth as first line, then uh, levofloxacin can be used as a second line therapy. How about third line? So some patients, very small a number of patients, do fail even the second line therapy. So in such situations, it is recommended that we actually take a biopsy, culture the bacteria, test for sensitivity before, you're giving, before giving the third line therapy. And uh, you will not use uh, the previous uh, use antibiotic. And it's important also to, in terms when patients fail therapy, to ensure that uh, it is not a compliance issue. So you need to take a proper history find out how compliant the patients to the uh, antibiotic treatment. Now, I would like to uh, mention briefly about this new um, uh, acid suppression drug, which is vonoprazen. Okay, now, vonoprazen is a different group of uh, acid blocker, different from the conventional PPI. It's actually a potassium competitive acid blocker it has a very long duration of action and it causes rapid and strong inhibition of gastric acid secretion. And it has been used in Japan mainly to uh, treat H. pylori. So in the conventional PPI is actually a pro-drug. So it needs to be activated in the acid environment of the stomach. And it's actually not very stable in the, in the acidic environment. And therefore, the, action, the onset of action is actually relatively slow. And if there are new uh, proton pump that is surface, uh, they may not be able to block uh, the uh, proton pump. Whereas the new drug, when not present, is actually very stable in the acidic environment and is able to block the uh, uh, proton pump and a very fast onset of action, very stable uh, acid suppression, and a long duration of action as well. So, its bioactivity is almost 300 times that of a PPI. So, in Japan, when you look at some of these studies, it is actually superior to uh, conventional PPI in eradicating the H. pylori. So this can be a new strategy because of the increasing trend of uh, antibiotic resistance to the, uh, of, the, of the H. pylori. Right? 
So when you use uh, venoprazine instead of a PPI, we can expect um, a higher eradication rate for H. pylori. And a certain uh, randomized trials are being carried out now to look at the effectiveness and also whether it can be uh, uh, translated into other populations in terms of the H. pylori eradication. So there is a change in the strategy of not just replacing uh, different antibiotics, but also looking at the acid suppression part because the antibiotic works best in a pH of about six. And, and if you have very uh, stable kind of uh, acid suppression, then the success rate of the H. pylori eradication uh, potentially is higher. So most patients can tolerate this uh, eradication. Uh, uh, there are some side effects. Uh, they may experience some nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, some GI side effects. Um, for classic, some patients may complain of some bitter metallic taste in the mouth. And if you use bismuth as part of your therapy, it may also cause uh, some discoloration of the stool. Okay, so we look at the H. pylori and its association with gastric cancer. Now, there are two important questions we want to know. That is, can eradication really reduce the gastric cancer risk? Also, whether it is a viable option to screen the population for H. pylori and eradicate them before uh, the patients can have a chance to develop into gastric cancer. So a recent uh, study, a meta-analysis and systematic review look at some of these uh, randomized trials as well as cohort studies. So they look at quite a large number of studies and they stratify according to the incidence of gastric cancer. And they found that in areas or in studies that have patients who are from areas with intermediate to high risk of gastric cancer, by eradicating the H. pylori, actually reduce the risk of gastric cancer. Okay. For those who are places where there are much lower incidence, then the effect may not be so well seen. And they also look at the different scenario by like patients who are asymptomatic and those patients who have some early gastric cancer that was resected by endoscopic means and they follow them up. And still the trend, they found that if you eradicate the H. pylori, the chances of developing gastric cancer is reduced. So it's been shown that if you eradicate H. pylori, it can potentially reduce the risk of uh, gastric cancer. However, if you look at, if you're talking about screening the entire population for H. pylori and treating them, then you have to consider some of these factors before you can realize uh, uh, the benefit. So first of all, I think the, the, the places or the population have to have a relatively high incidence of H. pylori infection. It must have a relatively high incidence of gastric cancer as well. And then uh, when you have a screening program, you need to ensure that the participation rate must be high and the test must be accurate. And, and also when you decide to treat the um, bacteria, the participation rate for treatment has also to be relatively high and you must have a, a very efficacious strategy to treat them. The compliance rate must be high. The reinfection rate must be low. And also I mentioned that you have to time your treatment. So the earlier the intervention, the better the outcome. All right, so these factors must be realized before you can actually see a significant reduction in the gastric cancer risk. So I think in Japan, they have started this eradication program, but so far um, they have not been able to show conclusively that the gastric cancer rate has uh, reduced. But although uh, probably there is still a lag time, for, for to demonstrate this uh, effect. 
So in conclusion, um, the single most important factor responsible for the development of gastric cancer actually is the chronic infection with H. pylori. However, the risk is not just H. pylori, but also the summation of the interaction, the complex interaction between the bacteria, the host, as well as other factors in the environment. And H. pylori can be a possible viable strategy for prevention of gastric cancer. But it's important to know that even if you eradicate H. pylori for patients who are already at higher risk, for example, if they already have atrophic gastritis or intestinal metaplasia, it is still important to, to have endoscopic surveillance so that you can pick up uh, the gastric cancer early and uh, treat them early to have a better outcome. All right, so um, thank you for your um, attention. Hi, Kong Hee. Yeah, thank you very much. That was a good talk. And uh, there are quite a few questions from uh, the doctors who were, were attending. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your questions. So we'll, we'll try to get through some of the questions. Uh, one of the doctors, Dr. Chua, was asking, how long does it take for HP antibody to become negative after eradication of the infection? And how do we as GP manage a patient with a positive uh, HP antibody? Maybe you're going to take that one? Yeah. Okay, so I think, uh, okay, the first question is that I think it can actually remain positive up to three years or even sometimes longer. So therefore, it is not a good test to see whether the patient has got an active uh, infection. So having said that, so I think if you have a patient who is uh, found to be positive and he has not had previous um, uh, H. pylori uh, uh, diagnosis, has not been treated before, you can assume that he probably has uh, uh, H. pylori. However, you must uh, explain to the patient that because he may be taking antibiotics for other reasons or other infections, and sometimes he may have already, the bacteria is not already present anymore. So you may be actually treating someone without active infection. So in my opinion, I think it is probably better to, to prove that the patient has got active infection. So one way is either to do a urea breath test, which is non-invasive, or to do a stool antigen test. Okay, then uh, coming to the stool antigen test, there were a few questions about that. Um, the, they were asking whether the stool antigen test can be used for adults, uh, and which lab does the stool antigen test, and if you know how much it costs. I think um, it can be used for adults, certainly, uh, but in my practice, uh, I generally use the urea breath test more or the endoscopy. So I'm not able to, um, I'm not sure which lab has the um, uh, availability and also I'm, I'm not aware of the cost. Lab, but I think, um, I think Path Lab may have it, but I need to find out, I'm not exactly sure. Okay, well, we were looking at it and uh, we found that the uh, SGH will, have, the lab has uh, the capability to do the stool antigen test. Um, so we'll send that link on the chat and you can check that link uh, if you want to do that test. Another question was also about uh, intestinal metaplasia because that's sometimes uh, what we see, you know, especially in the pathology report. And uh, the question is, how often should a patient with uh, intestinal metaplasia be followed up? And does the patient need lifelong surveillance? Yeah, this is a very good question. So yeah, intestinal metaplasia actually is not that uncommon, but you need to also look at the overall risk of the patient. So uh, whether the patient has got a family history, whether the patient is a smoker, and also the extent of the intestinal metaplasia, whether it is focal or very, whether it's diffuse. So sometimes when we take a biopsy, uh, it's also important for us to take from more than one area. So <clears throat> take from the antrum also, you can take from the body as well, 
and sometimes even the insusura. So you look at the how extensive, whether all the biopsy turn out to have uh, intestinal metaplasia or whether it is just a focal area or whether it's very extensive. So the risk actually differs. So if it is a focal uh, intestinal metaplasia with no other risk factors, uh, you can actually uh, do surveillance uh, maybe every three years uh, to, to do endoscopic surveillance. But if there are other risk factors or very extensive intestinal metaplasia on top of that with atrophic gastritis, then you may actually do closer surveillance uh, uh, up to maybe once a year to do the um, endoscopy. Um, so I think the, of course, to discuss with the patient about the, uh, because intestinal metaplasia is considered precancerous, so uh, I would actually consider, uh, uh, consider lifelong follow-up for these patients. Okay, that's good to know, especially because uh, since you say it's precancerous, then obviously it's very important for us to make sure we screen them adequately to prevent that from happening. Another question that was asked uh, was in terms of the Nexium dose, uh, whether it should be a 20 or 40 milligram dose. Uh, so what is your, your choice? I think uh, it is important to, to, like I said, to maintain the acid suppression during the triple therapy to increase the eradication rate. So I would actually give 40 milligram for Nexium, 40 milligram BD dose. Um, and um, like up to 10 days to two weeks. So that will actually um, usually have an eradication rate of about 85, 90% uh, eradication rate. So in this case, if you're using uh, the Vosinti, would you be doing 10 to 14 days as well, or is seven days enough? Okay, so, so Vosinti, so uh, it actually, from the Japanese papers, they actually use it for seven days, all right now. So Vosinti is, uh, is an exception. So if you're using Vosinti or Vernoprazen, then the regime can be shortened to seven days because they found that it is equally effective, or if not more effective, than the 14 day duration. Um, but bear in mind that uh, it's a relatively new drug and uh, the, the, uh, it is metabolized by the liver. And so in patients who have uh, liver uh, impairment in terms of the function, uh, you may want to be more careful uh, with using this drug. Otherwise it is actually a very good a uh, new drug for, for H. pylori as well as for those with uh, recalcitrant uh, erosive esophagitis or for GERD. Okay, and uh, there was another question also about patients who have uh, recurrent dyspepsia uh, despite all the tests and OGD being normal and already on PPI and diet advice, what would you advise for this group of patients? Okay, so I think for, for dyspepsia, yeah. So um, besides um, evaluating them, uh, the stomach in terms of checking for um, gastritis, uh, ulcers, H. pylori, right? You may also want to consider other uh, causes of dyspepsia uh, because dyspepsia is, is quite non-specific. So, you need to consider diagnoses such as uh, gallstone disease, uh, chronic uh, pancreatitis. And if you have excluded most of these conditions, uh, then sometimes it may be what we call a non-ulcer or functional dyspepsia. And it could be associated with uh, irritable bowel uh, syndrome as well. So uh, in these patients, uh, yeah, like besides uh, PPI, um, diet. Sometimes uh, you need to see whether they have, um, uh, in terms of delayed gastric emptying, motility problem as well. So sometimes uh, uh, a short course of uh, prokinetic agents may be possible. Um, and uh, in terms of dietary advice, I generally will tell the patient to take um, the small frequent meals. Um, and try to identify some of the trigger foods. For example, very spicy foods, 
very fatty foods, oily foods, uh, even caffeine, uh, things like that, uh, and and manage uh, some of these, uh, and also certain foods um, uh, can produce uh, a gas as well. So some patients may have also a lactose intolerance. So you may want to take a bit more, dig deeper into their history. Um, and and some, of, some patients are vegetarian who take a lot of, uh, for example, uh, beans, um, they may also end up with uh, bloating and uh, gas in the tummy. So these are some of the things you can um, uh, consider. But sometimes uh, also um, to manage the expectations that uh, you can control some of these symptoms, but it may come back uh, again sometimes during uh, stressful times, uh, you have work stress, uh, things like that. Uh, they may have, uh, the, the symptoms may become worse during these uh, times yeah and in terms of the prokinetic agents uh, are there any that you prefer to use okay so prokinetic agents i think um, you also need to be careful uh, you probably won't want to use it for long term so it depends on the symptoms uh, you can use uh, 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 exelon uh, you can use uh, uh, motilium as well. So uh, these are uh, some, for a short period of time, sometimes it may work for some patients. And then uh, there's another question on a uh, reinfection. So in a patient who has had successful H. pylori uh, eradication before and confirmed on a, a negative UBT already, what are the chances of reinfection? And in such a case, do we repeat the same treatment or do we need to use second line? Okay, so um, reinfection rate actually is very low. Um, in general, it's quoted about 2 to 4%, uh, slightly higher in, in uh, women and children. Um, so reinfection means that you've already confirmed that um, previously successful eradication and then for some reason, they get reinfected. So, it's uh, you can use the first line treatment. You can use uh, the same antibiotics, or you can also choose uh, different uh, antibiotics. Uh, and it's important to 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 check the eradication rate again after the uh, treatment. And sometimes you may want to screen the close uh, family members as well whether they have got uh, H. pylori and treat uh, the family members as well. Okay, thank you, Kong Hee. That was a very good session. And I think we managed to answer most of the questions that were asked. If any of the uh, participants still have any questions, do uh, write into the Q&A and we can take that up and reply to you subsequently. Or you can email us at our email address. And this is our next webinar that's coming up on the 16th of July. We're gonna be talking about common breast, uh, benign breast complaints, and also red flags that need urgent referral by Dr. Tanya Aswam, who is a general and breast surgeon, also president of the Singapore Medical Association. For those registrants who agreed to receive further notification, we will soon be sending you the link uh, to this webinar. If at any time you wish to uh, request for the registration, you can email us at events at nexussurgical.sg, the address as you see in this slide. So we look forward to seeing everybody at our next uh, webinar and hope you have found this webinar useful and uh, helps in your clinical practice. So thank you very much for everybody for attending and thank you Dr. Lim for a great talk. Thank you. So we will keep the webinar running for a short while in case uh, anybody still has any further questions that they, you would like to ask. Please do uh, ask in the Q&A section and we'll get back to you or email us at the email given below. Thank you very much.